Lab three focuses on the trophic state of water. In lab three, the objective will be to determine the trophic state of a pond, lake, wetland, county drain, or river, that is, any body of water. You will need to sample at several locations and depths to evaluate the variability of the water quality and to assess the trophic state. For this lab, you are to work in your assigned team, that is the same team that you worked with for lab one. When looking at the trophic system of a water body, we're essentially looking at the pro primary productivity in that system. The stoichiometry of photosynthesis, photosynthesis is shown here. And as you can see, it is dependent on carbon, nitrogen, phosphorus, oxygen, and also hydrogen. The ratio of nitrogen to phosphorus is about seven to one on a mass basis. So typically more nitrogen is needed than phosphorus. Leibig's law of the minimum states that growth will be limited by the availability of the nutrient that is least available relative to need. And typically in many aquatic systems, it's either nitrogen or phosphorus that is the limiting nutrient. The productivity of an ecosystem is also dependent on sunlight and temperature, and as I mentioned, the availability of nutrients. And as you can see in this graph here, chlorophyll A, which is a surrogate for algae growth, primary productivity, is a function of total phosphorus. Few organisms can use nitrogen in N2 form, most will use ammonia, nitrate, or nitrate. In this experiment here, we will focus on measuring ammonia, nitrate, nitrate, and we will also measure phosphate. The productivity of an ecosystem, as I mentioned, is dependent on the presence of these nutrients. We classify lake productivity in this way with a lake with a low producti primary productivity referred to as oligotrophic and that with a high primary productivity as eutrophic or hypereutrophic. And as you can see here, as we move from oligotrophic, mesotrophic, eutrophic, and then hypereutrophic, the concentration of chlorophyll A increases, so you can expect greater algal growth in a hypereutrophic lake than an oligotrophic lake. You'll also see that there are higher concentrations of phosphorus in a eutrophic lake than in a oligotrophic lake. And secchi depth is the depth to which a black and white disk can be observed from the surface of that water body. And what you see is that it's inversely proportional or dependent on this productivity level. As productivity increases, the secchi depth decreases. So the lake body of water is more turbid. So ligotrophic lakes are lakes that are typically cool they typically have high oxygen levels and provide a suitable environment for fish such as trout, whitefish. Lake Superior is a oligotrophic lake. These lakes typically have low availability of nutrients, especially phosphorus and nitrogen, and therefore have low concentrations or densities of phytoplankton and other plants that typically would grow along the shoreline. Jenny Lake in the Grand Tetons is also an oligotrophic lake. Lake Michigan is a mesotrophic lake. These lakes have a higher level of primary productivity. You'll see algal growth in late summer. You see more plant growth along the shoreline and often decidual, deciduous trees along the shore also. 
Oligotrophic lakes have a high degree of productivity. It's a picture satellite image of Lake, Super Lake Erie showing the nutrient-induced algal blooms. These lakes are typically warm. They often have a low oxygen availability, and they favor organisms that can tolerate that low oxygen level, typically organisms such as catfish and boffins. These have a high availability of nutrients, especially phosphorus and nitrogen, and often you'll see high densities of phytoplankton. You'll see a significant amount of plant life along the shoreline. <clears throat> and as I mentioned, you'll see typically these lakes are more turbid, so the secchi depths are much less than you would see in a, in a legotrophic lake. What you will measure, as I previously stated, is ammonia. We'll use a salicylate method. So sodium salicylate reacts with ammonia. It's a two-step reaction, and it forms this blue-green colored dye. And what you will do is use the color wheel that you've been provided in the API Master Kit to determine ammonia concentrations. You will also determine nitrite. Nitrite <clears throat> reacts with sulfonylamide um, to produce this purple magenta color. So again, you will use the color wheel to estimate the nitrite concentrations. In most waters with oxygen present, I don't anticipate that you will see significant concentrations of ammonia or nitrite. However, if the oxygen is deficient, you may see concentrations of ammonia and nitrite, and that's a good indication that that water body is oxygen deficient. Nitrate, nitrate is measured with the cadmium reduction method, and in this case, the kit um, provides you with the solution where the cadmium particles <clears throat> reduce the nitrate to nitrite, and then the nitrates react to form this nice red color. And again, you'll use the color wheel. Phosphate is analyzed by the molybdate blue ascorbate method. And this is a complexation reaction between molybdate and phosphorus in the presence of ascorbate ions, and it produces this blue-green color. There's more details on these various tests that I've provided both in the lab write-up, and there's some additional details that API has provided to us that I've posted on the course blog. So in assessing the trophic state, as I mentioned, we will be looking at the concentrations of phosphate and we'll look at nitrate or nitrite and ammonia. So waters that have a high level of pollution, you'll expect to find high phosphates and or high nitrate. And where there is little evidence of pollution, you'll expect to find lower concentrations of phosphate and or nitrate. So just to reiterate some of the safety issues, please make sure that you review the safety lecture before beginning this lab. Always make sure to complete, to completely read the lab activity and the safety data sheets before beginning the lab. Make sure you're conducting your experiments in a safe location. Make sure it's well ventilated and protected from spills, children, pets, etc. Um, make sure you're wearing appropriate PPE, gloves uh, in particular, and goggles. And then make sure you are sampling in a safe locate and secure location. I do not want you to fall into a body of water. So safety is paramount here in terms of your well-being. Uh, wear protective clothing, and if necessary, wear insect repellent or sunscreen when you are out sampling. 
And please let someone know where you plan to sample and when you plan to return. If you do choose to work with your group, please make sure to maintain at least six foot physical distance and wear masks whether you're working on campus or off. And if you're not, if you don't live in the same household, please do not ride in the same vehicle when you're traveling to sampling locations. So the sampling locations can be rivers, streams, lakes, ponds, um, it can be a county drain, basically any freshwater system. Possible sampling locations in East Lansing and Meridian Township are given here. The link actually is a link to a Google map that is interactive so you can click on that map and click on the location to actually find the actual location. I've tried to find some possible places um, within the vicinity of Michigan State where you could do your sampling. So in terms of the supplies that you will need, you want a sampling collecting device. This should be a clean plastic wide mouth container, for example, a peanut butter jar. I would suggest so you can sample um, to depth, tape that securely to a long pole, for example, a broom handle. Um, duct tape works well. If you need to borrow one and you're in close vicinity, I have one that I have created that I made here, and then we also have one in the a CEE environmental lab that I can arrange for you to borrow. You'll need clean glass or plastic containers for your samples, especially if you wish to do the analyses at your, in your home lab. You will want to do pH on site. Uh, you want a discard container. If you're going to do the analyses on site, you want to be able to discard that these solutions at home in the sewer. Uh, you want your temperature and conductivity probe. You want to measure temperature on site. Also, you can measure conductivity at home, but you'll need to measure, you'll want to measure temperature on site. And then you'll need tap water for rinsing your containers, rinsing your sampling vials um, for the analysis. And Lastly, you want a clean, dry surface to work on. If you are actually doing the analysis on site, if you're in a location where there's a picnic table, that would be ideal. Um, but you really do want a clean, dry surface uh, on which to work. <clears throat> so as I mentioned, you will work within your team. Um, just three students. Teams actually now are between two and four students. So I've tried to write up the numbers in that way. Um, you'll want to record the GPS for each of your sampling locations because you'll have to map these locations as part of your report. And you will want to measure pH, temperature, conductivity, phosphate, nitrate, nitrite, and ammonia. As I mentioned, you want to measure pH and temperature on site. The others can be done once you return home. You'll repeat the phosphate nitrate, nitrite and ammonia tests once at least three times. So basically I want you to get the mean, standard deviation and confidence interval, but I don't want you to have to do it like you did for lab one on all of the samples. So you'll only have to do that once. At each site, make observations regarding the water quality and the site conditions. For example, what is the color of the water? Is there any presence or absence of aquatic organisms, algae, plants? Um, are there any nearby sources of pollution? This could be fertilized lawns, it could be roads. Take photos for your report. It will make it much easier and it'll actually make for a much more readable report. And lastly, leave no trace. It's one of the reasons why I ask you to bring a discard container. I want you to discard all of your solution, your analytical solutions in that, bring it home and rinse that down the, down the 
strain, please do not discard that material that those solutions on site. So each student is to sample at least two locations and is to take at least two samples at each location. This could be a surface versus depth that could be on either side of a river or either side of the drain. <clears throat> but I want a total of four samples taken per student. You can take more if you'd like, but as a minimum, you need to take four. So option one is to choose a lake of at least 185 acres, something really reasonably large, um, less than 600 acres. Basically, I want you to pick a lake where you can get reasonable rep representation. Don't pick Lake Michigan. You're not going to get a reasonable rep representation of Lake Michigan with somewhere between four and eight samples. Um, so something like you know, Park Lake, Lake Lansing. <clears throat> you can also pick a detention ton, pond. It's not going to be 185 acres, but you can easily get uh, representation there. Each student is to take at least two samples, as I mentioned. For instance, one at the surface, one at depth. Try and estimate the depth. Make sure your sampling locations are pub publicly accessible and make sure they're safe. Please do not go and try and um, push your way through the bush, through swamps, whatever, to take samples. Be safe. Option two would be to choose a river or stream. I've shown you some locations. Uh, along the Grand River. I've tried to pick locations that I know are accessible uh, safely. So think about that. Again, you'll pick between two to eight locations. They depend on the number of students. Um, I've suggested that they be at least a quarter of a mile apart to give some variability. Um, and again, your sampling locations are dependent on public access and safety. Option three is to choose a watershed. And here you can pick a different body of water for each team member, but the body of water should be the same type. So county drain, a wetland, a detention pond, and a subdivision. That is here, you can pick a smaller body of water, uh, for instance, a detention pond, because you're only going to take two samples at that detention pond, but another of your teammates will collect two samples at a different detention pond. You really need, with all of these options, to be coordinating with your team member in terms of what you're going to sample, where you're going to sample, and when you're when you will sample. Again, Sampling locations are dependent on public access and safety. Finally, option four are for those teams where the team members are not located in close proximity and simply pick one body of water per team member. Typically, you're going to want to pick something relatively small. Um, don't pick a very large lake or a very large river. Uh, unless you absolutely have to do that. And again, you want each student is to take four samples, two locations, and two or more depths. Or for instance, if you pick a river stream, you can do essentially the same location, but on both sides of the body of water. All water bodies are to be fresh water, so no seawater. And sampling locations are, again, Again, dependent on public access and safety. So in summary, each, each student will take four samples, two locations, two samples at each location. One sample must be analyzed in triplicate. You can take more samples than that. <clears throat> Students must coordinate locations with their team. You need to design, decide on a plan of where to sample and when to sample. 
Ideally, all sampling should be done on the same day and as close to the same time as possible. I've also posted a video about sampling, so it would be beneficial to review that video before you decide where to sample, when to sample. That video talks about sampling plans, talks about how to sample, talks about uh, random sampling versus stratified sampling. That will be beneficial. It'll really help you think through how you're going to plan these experiments. Note any recent weather conditions. Have there been recent rainfall events? If so, how much rainfall? What was the air temperature? If you're sampling a stream or river in the U.S., then check the USGS gauging station flow rates. It's beneficial to look at that in terms of your water quality. So the equipment that you will need for this the phosphate test kit, the ammonia nitrate and nitrate test kit, or the freshwater master test kit, that also has a pH and high pH range, so you won't need the water, <clears throat> the pH chlorine test, so you can use that, just those two, and then you'll need your temperature conductivity probe. For the analysis, you will determine pH, temperature, conductivity, etc., on the samples that you have collected. As I mentioned, you will determine the mean standard deviation and confidence interval for each of these tests, report all your data in tabular form, and then what you will do is you'll use ANOVA like we did in assignment one to determine if the differences in the concentrations measured are statistically significant at a 95% confidence level. Now within your discussion, I want you to discuss your sampling plan. This really gets to that video that I mentioned. Was your sampling plan consistent with the sampling plans discussed in the video? Did your plan introduce bias? If so, how? How might you overcome that bias with a different sampling plan? I want you to use your data to assess the trophic level and health of that body of water or bodies of water. Discuss any evidence regarding levels of nitrogen or phosphorus. This includes the observations. Think about what are the potential sources of nitrogen or phosphorus. How might they be mitigated? And discuss the spatial variability in your results. Is the data sufficient or are the, are the data sufficient to represent the trophic level. Provide a recommendation in your memo, memo regarding the spatial variability and sensitivity of your analytical methods to more accurately or precisely assess the trophic level. So your report here will take a, the form of a memo. The memo does not need to be long. It will be a memo to the Regional Environmental Action Council, for instance, WIMIAC, which is West Michigan Environmental Action Council, MM is Michigan Environmental Action Council, WIMIAC. <clears throat> if your sites are in multiple municipalities, if on the other hand, all of your sites are in Meridian Township, for example, then your memo should be addressed to the Meridian Township Environmental Commission. If they're all in East Lansing, then it would be the East Lansing Meridian Environmental Commission. If you're uh, taking all your samples on the MSU can campus, then the memo should be addressed to the MSU Office of Sustainability. If you're not sure, ask. Within your memo, you are to present your objectives, a brief description of your methods, the map of your sampling locations, and your results, discussions, and recommendation. Remember, you are providing your expertise. Not all members of the councils or committees are experts in environmental engineering, limnology, ecology, etc. So think about how do you present your this information in an effective way. Think about communicating. 
Okay, you're commuting, you're communicating with a particular audience. Option four, your report is to take the form of a memo to one of these agencies, either the head of the United Nations Environment Program, the director of the Office of Wetlands, Oceans, and Watersheds at the US EPA, or the director of the Water Resources Division in the Michigan Department of Environment, Great Lakes and Energy. Again, if you're not sure, please ask. Your memo will provide essentially the same information as previously mentioned. And then your appendix will include a summary of all your lab data that includes a discussion of the limitations of your analysis and how you could obtain more accurate data. If you feel that there's information that I requested in the discussion that um, doesn't really belong in that memo, then put it in the, in the appendix. You'll also include scanned images of the raw data from your lab notebook and photos documenting your work. Photos, one on the left is from the detention pond in my neighborhood and the sample that I collected this summer when I was doing some of these experiments.